non crede nel vittimismo e, e ce lo dimostra andando in bicicletta tra le gole dell'Afghanistan. Shannon, please, can you join us? Okay, have a look. <laughs> so what do you see when you look at this picture? Do you see opportunity? Do you see a change maker? Do you see hope? Because around the world, women like these are forced to beg in the streets. Rape is used as a weapon of war. Children are taken from their homes and forced into prostitution. And around the world, we hear constantly of these tragedies, of these atrocities, stories of genocide. And the sheer numbers of these stories is staggering. So staggering, in fact, that often we simply tune out, overwhelmed by the sheer numbers. Apathy sets in, and we simply tune out. We know that something should be done. We know we should help those people, those victims. But I'm just one person. What can I possibly do? And so we go back to our bubbles, overwhelmed by the news. But I believe that when you can put a face on an individual and use that face to tell the story of the bigger atrocity, of the bigger problem that we face, that you can humanize the problem. That by tuning in, essentially plugging in to the heartbreak of the one, we can understand the concepts facing the many. This one, these are all out of sync. <laughs> this one has a face and a story and is not someone that should be lumped in with the many just because we are too apathetic to see what is going on. Ernest Hemingway said dramatically, the world tries to break everyone. Some of us can be stronger in the places that were broken. But when we gloss over the individuals, when we reside in apathy, instead of the positivity of hope, of change, of progress, we limit our abilities to ever create change because we can't see past the masses. We can't see past the bigger problem. So I would ask you the same question that I asked of the woman begging in the streets. What do you see when you look at me? Do you see an adventurer, an activist, a mother, a daughter, a fighter? Or perhaps, do you see a victim? Do you see a woman who was attacked and nearly killed, left for dead, a victim at 18? Had I family and friends that labeled me a victim, had I perhaps been born in a different country than the United States, that label may have been more appropriate. Instead, I looked at the idea of being a victim as perhaps the worst label possible, worse perhaps even than the crime itself that I had survived. It's a label that would def forever define me, limiting my potential based on experience that was completely out of my control versus my own potential to create change in the world. In Afghanistan, uh, I have been working there for six years. This is what we think of. We see faceless women. We see masses of children starving. Uh, we see mass oppression. And we ignore the human quality. We forget what is possible and what can change. Um, I brought an object, very small, silver barrette that was given to me in the Kandahar women's prison in southern Afghanistan. To me, this has become a talisman that reminds me of the resilience that we all have 
And for me, that resilience is really key to rebirth. The woman that gave me this barrette uh, was in jail, uh, supposedly for murder. Her crime is, is kind of inconsequential. You don't know what's true and what's false often, as there's very few lawyers, especially for women. But she was the fourth wife of a 60-year-old man. She was a beautiful woman in her 20s who had been beaten repeatedly. Um, she had cuts up and down her arms for where she had been um, beaten and cut with knives. And the other three wives uh, to this six-year-old man had already died ahead of her from his beatings. And she showed me a completely different way of viewing her life in that for her, jail was in some respects a safe house. She was surrounded by other women. There was a sisterhood that had formed. And while no one would choose jail over freedom, certainly not uh, with morality crimes, and the fact that most of these women were jailed under laws that we would not consider a jailable offense or even an offense in the first place. At the same time, there was a desire to share a story and to be heard. There's power in voice. She gave me this barrette, which I did not want to take, and uh, forced it into my hand. I tried to give it back, not wanting to take anything. And she and two other women took out my ponytail from underneath my headscarf and combed my hair and put this in my hair. And it has become my talisman. It goes with me everywhere. Um, I've ridden my bike across Afghanistan. This was in my pack. I travel um, throughout the US. This is with me. And it's a reminder that part of my job is to have empathy for every human that I meet, that it is the individual that is going to create change. It is not large esoteric organizations. It's not our governments. It's down to individuals standing up and using their voice. And what struck me in the Kandahar prison was that the power of voice is so integral to rebirth. It is so integral to the ability to make change even in a Kandahar prison. This woman's voice is now outside of that prison. It travels with me wherever I go, and I'm able to share her story and others around the world, to others around the world. And it takes the burqa off of the face. It humanizes. So for me, the power of resilience is to realize that underneath the burqas, we have faces. And if we can empower individuals and send them forth as citizen diplomats and work one at a time, then we can believe in the power of change for the next generation because it takes each of us using our voices one at a time, putting our drops in the bucket one at a time. And these girls uh, are three girls that were in Kabul, but they, to me they represent the first story that I ever encountered in Afghanistan, which to me best symbolized resilience for everyone, which was Three girls had been attacked in Kandahar. This is back in 2007, 2008. And uh, they were walking to school, just like these young girls, when two men on motorcycles came and threw acid on their faces, permanently disfiguring them. Two years later, they were all back in school, standing up to the Taliban daily, still walking to school, refusing to be victims, refusing to be terrorized with their family support. It's not about making these grand plans. It's about step by step, taking the step, refusing to be a victim. This work doesn't come without risk. <clears throat> these girls are the same age as my daughter, and I don't know what I would do if she willingly walk to school taking this risk. But I wonder what we would do as a nation, as a global community, if we were willing to embrace the risks together and to stand up and use our voices for those that don't have a voice. I've probably used up more than uh, one of my nine lives working in Afghanistan. The work that I do is taking great financial and physical risks. But the resiliency that is built up in me from my own experiences and from working in Afghanistan is one 
that looks beyond the risks and looks at the opportunity that's created, that believes that it is the role of all of us as citizen diplomats to go forth and create change. It's, the, it's worth the risk because the reward is beyond what we as individuals can collect. The reward is social justice, a safer world, a more just world. And if we can consider that everyone has a voice and that victims inherently have a stronger backbone because of what they have survived, we can eliminate the label that limits their potential and disempowers them because we look at them as change makers. And then we simply empower victims to have a voice. We can change lives, communities, and sustainably we can create a catalytic effect through the individual. Risk doesn't mean that you have to start an organization in a war zone. Risk can mean that you simply stand up for those that do not have a voice. Life is a series of risks and opportunities, and it's up to all of us to embrace that if we truly want what we are all here for, which is a rebirth in some fashion, in our communities, in our countries, and in the global humanity, it's up to each of us to look outside ourselves and into our communities to where we can speak for the children, for gay rights, for women's rights, for human rights. Because we see that they and I are not just victims. We are the catalyst for change. Thank you. <laughs>